This video is sponsored by World of Warships. Since the dawn of naval warfare, the primary threat to a warship was another one of its kind. The deadliness of a vessel was measured by the size of its guns or the thickness of its armor. In 1914, that all began to change, for we saw the first use of aircraft in an attack on an enemy ship. Once again, I'm partnering up with Brandon F. for a double feature on the Battle of Sing Tao. He'll be covering the more land-based and political aspects of this little-known battle, while I cover the air. Let's dive right into the story of the first time planes were used in naval combat. Before we go any further, I've got a little ad to show you. The World of Warships boys were kind enough to let me pass this on to you. Yes, you! The one looking at the screen! World of Warships is a hell of a game that lets you fight in dozens of warships across 40 maps. Everything from destroyers and submarines up to dreadnoughts and fleet carriers get to face off in vast 12v12 arenas. I started playing this game pretty recently, and I regret waiting this long. The game is legitimately engaging, it looks absolutely gorgeous, and is easy to pick up and learn. There's always something new to do, too, as World of Warships receives monthly updates and even crossover events. What other game can you crew warships based on Godzilla and King Kong, man? I mean, come on. They even have Azure Lane crossovers for all you uh, anime fans out there, you know, if you're into that stuff. Now, how much would you pay for such an experience? You might be thinking, well, I do only need one kidney. <laughs> Not so fast, sport. Cancel that doctor's appointment. World of Warships is free to play. Oh, but Falcon, I don't have a PC to play this on. My guy, World of Warships is now available on consoles. Click the link in the description and get into the fight today. Now's the time for anyone to become a warship captain, and I'll let you in on a little scuttlebutt. Just between us. If you enter the code BRAVO when you sign up, you'll get a little present. You'll land yourself 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium account time, and a ship all for free. But we'll keep that our little secret. Now get out there and get playing, champ. And on that note, back to the video. Most believe the first seaborne strike took place on Christmas Day in 1914, when seaplanes from HMS Engadine attacked a Zeppelin base. However, this is almost three months after a raid that took place in the Far East. Far away from the Western Front, the German naval base at Tsingtao, China was home to the Imperial German Navy's East Asia Squadron. Now, by August of 1914, the majority of the fleet, which included six cruisers, had dispersed into the Pacific, but a small force of gunboats and an Austro-Hungarian cruiser remained. The protected cruiser, Kaiser and Elizabeth, was armed with eight 15cm guns, two of which were high-velocity, long-barreled variants. In addition to her main battery, she carried several machine guns, but as an aerial threat had never really presented itself, none of them were really in a configuration suitable to engage aircraft. The aerial threat came from an unexpected enemy for World War I, the Japanese. Imperial Japan had sided with the Entente at the war's outset, and while they didn't possess the fighting capacity they would have in the following war, they elected to dispatch 23,000 men to take Tsingtao. On September 6th, after an airplane scouting mission determined the German strength within the naval base, an MF-7 biplane was launched from the Japanese seaplane carrier Wakamiya. Wakamiya has a hell of a background. She started life in Port Duncan in the UK, having been built for the Imperial Russian Navy as a transport. Initially dubbed Lethington, she was captured by the Japanese during the Russo-Japanese War and renamed Takasaki Maru. The name didn't last long, as in 1907 she was redubbed Wakamiya Maru. The Japanese Navy was interested in maintaining a fleet of newly created seaplanes, and Wakamiya was converted into a carrier in 1913, the first of her kind for the IJN. Wakamiya was equipped with four Maurice Farman 7 seaplanes built under license in Japan. The French design Maurice Farman 7 was a little more advanced than the frail experimental aircraft of the 1900s. She had no armament save for hand dropped bombs that could only fly at about 59 miles per hour on a good day. Even so, the MF7 evaded rifle and machine gun fire from the German warships and delivered her payload. Unfortunately for the Japanese, the hand dropped bombs all missed. Despite the lack of success, this would mark the first engagement between ships and planes, but the battle was far from over. 
On September 30th, Wakamiya struck a German mine and had to limp home for repairs. The seaplanes would remain in the theater, having been transferred to Laoshan Harbor to the west. From there, they continued the fight, primarily conducting reconnaissance for the Entente forces and dropping bombs and ground targets through November. Soon enough, Wakamiya's seaplanes would face an unexpected foe defending the Tsingtao Peninsula. The backbone of pre-war German air power was the Rumpler Taube. A simple bird-shaped monoplane, the Taube was an even simpler design than the MF7. They too carried no armament and, like their Japanese foes, were mainly used for reconnaissance. Two Taube were delivered to Sing Tao in early 1914 and were crewed by naval lieutenants Friedrich Mulekowski and Gunther Pluschau. Mulekowski was severely wounded in a takeoff which destroyed his monoplane, leaving Pluschau as the lone aviator over Sing Tao. Before the conflict kicked off, Pluschau crashed himself after an engine failure. Gunther's wreck wasn't nearly as severe as his wingman's, and the Taube would fly again. Unfortunately, it needed to have parts sent from Germany. Said parts were found to be rotted in their crates, and as the war kicked off, replacements quickly became nigh impossible to ship. Any new wings or propellers would need to be manufactured locally. At the time, China didn't have the means to produce aircraft parts effectively, and the crude replacements often hampered the Taube's performance. Despite all the setbacks, in the fall of 1914, Pluschau did manage to get up in the air and perform recce for the German Navy. On several missions, he was able to evade Japanese anti-aircraft fire, which had as little effect as their central power counterparts. Every few flights, Gunther would pass by Japanese seaplanes, neither of which were able to engage each other. Things would change as the Japanese aviators began to bring pistols into the air. I've not been able to track down the dates of the engagements between Gunther and the Japanese pilots, but in late September, Pluschau was buzzed by an MF7. Einmal war ich in meiner Beobachtung ganz vertieft, als mein Flugzeug sehr stark anfing zu schlingern und zu stampfen. Ich dachte, es wären wieder einmal Luftstörungen, die durch die vielen steilen, schofen Gebirge hervorgerufen wurden und ja, das ganze Fliegen in dieser Gegend so außerordentlich erschwert. Ohne also auszusehen, beobachtete ich weiter und erfasste nur mit der einen Hand des Wohnsteuer, um das Flugzeug zur Ruhe zu zwingen. Nach meiner Rückkehr wurde mir zu meinem Erstaunen erzählt, dass eines der feindlichen Flugzeuge dicht über mir weggeflogen war und alles dachte schön, ich würde von diesem heruntergeschossen werden. Some reports on the ground noted that the Japanese fired on Pluschau. Pluschau's own diary mentioned that he carried a Parabellum pistol, better known as the Luger P08. In his words, Das nächste Mal passte ich besser auf. Und als ich einen meiner feindlichen Landkollegen dicht unter mir erblickte, verfolgte ich ihn und schoss ihn mit meiner parabellen Pistole mit 30 Schuss herunter. 30 times is a hell of a lot of fire coming out of a P08, which normally carries 8 rounds per magazine. The details of the dogfight aren't noted, but I imagine that Talba and MF7 circled one another for minutes as the two pilots fired on each other. Pluschau would have to hold the Talba's stick with his knees and reload the Luger at least four times, only to take offhand shots at his enemy colleague. A true feat, if it's true at all. The German pilot claimed to wound or kill the Japanese pilot, sending his kite into a spiral and to crash into the countryside. The problem is that the Japanese Navy never reported any losses in their seaplane fleet over Jingtao. There are two options. Number one, the Japanese Navy could have lied to save face in the media. This happens quite a lot. Even today, militaries fudge their numbers or flat out deny losses to keep them from looking bad on the world scale. Then we have number two, Gunther Pluschau lied. Another thing that comes up in air combat in particular is that aviators will overexemplify their accomplishments. Even if he managed to hit the Japanese pilot who may have limped home unseen, he flat out states, I followed and shot him down. Now why would Gunther himself do something like that? Jingtao itself was on its last legs and the Entente siege sent the Germans running in all directions by November. Let's take a look at what happened after. This really paints a picture of what kind of man Lieutenant Pluschau was.
Puxiao himself narrowly avoided capture, flying his Taba 160 miles before running out of fuel and crashing at a rice paddy. From there, he escaped to Nanking and traveled to the United States on a journey to make it back to Germany. He ended up being captured by the British as his transport ship docked in Gibraltar. From there, he was taken to London as a prisoner, but Gunther wasn't done just yet. During a violent storm, he escaped from the prisoner camp he was held at and jumped ship on the channel ferry Princess Juliana, which was bound for the Netherlands. This, of course, made him the first and only prisoner to escape the British Isles in both world wars. Upon returning to Germany, he was dubbed the Hero of Qingtao, and was a huge propaganda asset for the Empire. As part of the Hero Package, he was given command of the Libau naval base in Latvia, and he wrote a book, The Adventures of the Aviator from Qingtao. The autobiography went on to sell three quarters of a million copies in 1917, which was a massive moneymaker for the Aviator. Don't get me wrong, Gunther had a hell of a story. But who would step in to discredit the hero of Ching Tao by giving more accurate information? A national hero like him could say anything about Ching Tao's air campaign because he was it. He was the only pilot on the German side. The first verified aerial victory happened on October 5, 1914, when French pilot Joseph Franz and his gunner Louis Quinot shot down a German biplane on the Western Front. Gunther's engagement was supposedly in September of that year, which if it happened, would make him the first pilot in history to achieve an air-to-air -air kill. This would further cement his name in history as well as help sell his books. Of course, it also made the German Empire look even better on the world stage. Had they won the war, of course. Sure, the Japanese had a reason to lie, but they at least had proof in that all their seaplanes were accounted for. Gunther Pluschau had a reason to lie, but he did so without needing any proof because the only one who would dispute it was the enemy. So take that as you will. The Battle of Qingtao was the first naval action that directly involved aircraft attacking ships. In the following years, aircraft were seen as an increasingly dangerous threat as technology improved. As aeroplanes grew faster and deadlier, a warship's arsenal would need to start including dedicated anti-aircraft weapons. By war's end, the light quick-fire guns were adapted to fire vertically and would further evolve in the interwar period. Planes would change the way warships fight and how they were destroyed. Twenty years later in the Second World War, we would see bombers striking decisive blows against the largest battleships in the world, including Bismarck and Yamato. In addition to fighting ships, this would mark one of the first air-to-air -air engagements in history, whether or not anyone was truly shot down in the hail of pistol fire. Pluschau would leave the German Navy in 1919 and become an explorer. Furthering his adventure repertoire by exploring Africa and South America, he would be killed in a plane crash near Brazo Rico in 1931. The plane he flew on his last flight was a Heinkel HD-24, nicknamed Jingtao. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you're interested in the Siege of Tsingtao and want to learn more, check out Brandon F's video on the subject. It'll be linked in the description. Once again, I want to thank World of Warships for sponsoring this video. It really is a fun game, and I do personally recommend it. Especially if you want to try out some of the early World War I cruisers similar to Kaiser and Elizabeth. Remember, you can use code BRAVO when signing up to get those 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium, and that free ship. My patrons and YouTube supers are always to be thanked, of course. And I especially want to give a shout out to my Ace of Aces tier on Patreon. Thanks to The Administrator, Tico, Jake Fuentes, Chuck45, Peck Ops, Inkyweb, 50 Deuce, Hunter S, Chris Quinn, Weefy, FB, Zaku2, and Shockwave. It's the support that you guys provide that keeps these videos pumping out. I really appreciate any support for myself or of my partner Hellion, who works tirelessly to create assets for my videos. Oh yeah, and uh, one more thing, it's been a while since I said this, but if you see that sun peering through the clouds, make sure you keep it at your back. Have a good one, fellas.